appreciate the fact that we're all here to get four hours of continuing legal education credit to learn about shared services. But I realize that this record crowd is here for one thing only, and that's to hear Eddie Abramoski talk about the Buffalo Bills. Uh, hopefully everybody got his book, The Tale of the Tape. If you didn't, too bad, you're out of luck. We, uh, <laughs> they're all gone. Uh, Eddie was kind enough to autograph them, so if you look on the inside flap, you'll see his, his actual autograph. I also want to introduce his driver, his wife, Pat Abramowski. Pat, right here, thank you very much. <laughs> and it's also good to point out that at this point that all of the proceeds from this book, which were provided to us by the folks in the Chautauqua Region Community Foundation, BWB and Vineyard, and I thank them for making this book possible, but all of it was uh, is sent to the Shaken Babies Foundation at the Buffalo Children's Hospital. Uh, and for that, Eddie and Pat have made sure that all of the money goes towards that foundation. It's just such a worthy cause. And for all the people who participated in that, thank you very much. And thanks for Pat and Eddie for making this happen. This, this week is Shaken Baby uh, Awareness Week in Buffalo. So they're having a lot of spots on the radio uh, about Shaken Baby. And Shaken Baby uh, uh, has gone down 50% in the Buffalo area since they've started this program. So it's really working, and we're pleased. And I uh, just acknowledge the, the great work the Abramowskis have done to make this possible. And they've used a tool which we're going to hear about. This in the form of a book, a book on anecdotes relating to the Buffalo Bills and why is Eddie important. He was there at the beginning. Eddie was there in 1960 when the concept of a Buffalo Bills was created. He was there because of relationships with Buster Ramsey and Ralph Wilson, and it was Ralph Wilson who really encouraged Eddie, having listened to you tell more war stories than you could count, Eddie write a book, and Eddie like said, well, I love to tell stories. I'm not necessarily a book writer, so thank God Milt Northrup, uh, exactly. with Ralph's encouragement, got him to write this book, and as Eddie was telling me a little bit earlier, that uh, the book which really is going to uncover the dirt will be written later, but only published posthumously. <laughs> <laughs> so for that, we're going to do it. One final thing is everybody wants to be able to hear what Eddie says. I so if anybody uh, is minus one up here, uh, let us know. <laughs> and if they can't hear me yet, I'm Greg Peterson. <laughs> And so uh, it's, it's here. So, uh, in many senses, having a guy like Eddie Abramowski here, it's even hard to get into the, the subject matter, except start dropping names. I mean, here's a guy who would saw it all, and I, and along with all these other folks, Eddie, are Buffalo Bills fans extraordinaire. And I did what every person would do uh, at my age, and, uh, interest, go back and get your old football cards. <laughs> and one of the things that I did was to get my football cards, and this is like 1963 or 64, and I'm just going to show you a few cards and just see if you like a name recognition. And I'm going to start with the guy who's the most enigmatic of them all, Cookie Gilchrist. Cookie Gilchrist. Uh, fantastic. Probably the best all-around football player in Bill's history could have played any position you wanted him to play. Six foot four, 251 pounds, 52 inch chest, 31 inch waist, size 13 C shoes, could run a four, five, five, 40, could punt, could kick off, was a better bit of linebacker than he was a fullback. Uh, never went to college, went from Harbrack High School to the Browns, got cut got sent up to Kitchener in the uh, minor league, Canadian league, where Harvey Johnson was coaching. And then when the bill started, we were having trouble, and we got Cookie uh, to come to, 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 to Buffalo. All right, now, we, we know a few stories uh, that such things as Cookie Gilchrist, to this day, has never really returned to Buffalo. No, he, he, he 
always wants, whenever they have anything for any of the teams, he wants an appearance fee. And that's Cookie Gilchrist. He was always different. He used to live in Toronto and drive to Buffalo to the thing, and he'd get caught at least three times a week for speeding, and then he'd tell me the Canadian cops are picking on him. I told him, well, you can't go 140 <laughs> trying to get because you're late for practice. But that was Cookie. He always had some kind of deal going. Like one year, he was going to, when we were in a playoff game, he was going to bring earmuffs and sell them to the fans as they come in. <laughs> okay? But he, when, he, when he tried to get them across the border, he didn't have any import permit. So by the time we got him, the game was long gone and everything else. So we had 3,000 earmuffs in the, in the equipment room <laughs> giving them away. <laughs> that was Cookie Gilchrist. I think you also told the story one time of one of his first games where during halftime... Yes, what, what, halftime, Cookie had a habit of changing his socks, jocks, and t-shirt and everything, and we, we had, he had come in on a, on a Thursday or something, we were going up to New Haven to play the, 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 the Titans at that time, because uh, the, 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 the coach at Yale was a good friend of Harvey, so they were going up for the game. So we started the first half and played, and played very well, and at halftime, he was just taking all his stuff off, and Saban looked at me and he said, Eddie, what's he doing, quitting? I said, I don't know, Lou, I'll go ask him. <laughs> <laughs> so we went over there and asked, he said, no, I just changed my uh, socks, shots, and t-shirt all the time. So that was another one of his rituals. Stu Barber. Stu Barber. We, we lived in Alden together. Stu was, 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 was a unique guy. He, he was uh, going to be made into a linebacker, and he, he lost all his weight. He got down to about 225 pounds, and Buster put him at tackle. <laughs> <laughs> and that, then he had to gain the weight back. He told me it was a lot easier gaining the weight than it was losing. But anyway, uh, a unique guy. I just saw him, what, this summer, honey? Christmas time. Christmas time. We saw him, him and his wife. Uh, they're living in uh, South Carolina now. What about Buster Ramsey? Buster Ramsey, you, unique guy. Uh, he he uh, uh, was, was just different. He, uh, uh, to me, uh, gave me my chance, so I'm always indebted to him. I kept uh, in touch with him. He uh, lived, uh, what was on 89, 90? He just died this last year. He just died this last year, and we talked to him on the phone. The last time I called, I got the, uh, the, the on the ward, and the nurse said, I'll see if Mr. Ramsey will come to the phone. And when she came back, she said, Mr. Ramsey don't want to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> but he, 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 he uh, was a unique guy. He, he, was, he would actually physically challenge the players. He would get in a stance and, and, and tell the guy, okay, block me, hit me. And the guy wouldn't hit him easier. And he wouldn't do it twice, and Buster would really haul off and knock him, knock him right on his keister. And he said, I said, hit me. And another youth, unique thing he used to ha have the players do, whenever they got caught out, we couldn't find them any money, so we'd make them do punishment. And what he used to, guys were out drinking or something, what he used to have them do is roll, lay on the ground and roll. A hundred yards, and invariably, every one of them would spit up. <laughs> that was his punishment. He said, you want to go out and drink? It'll be double the next time. That was Buster. He was uh, 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 think, uh, another thing I remember about Buster is he punched El Doro, uh, the quarterback for the, 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 the Titans. We were playing the Titans, and Richie McCabe, who was a coach, tackled him out, out, way late out of bounds. We got a 15-yard penalty. Well, Doro picked the ball up and threw it at Richie and hit him in the back. And when he did that, Buster turned around and hit him. So then when the league commissioner found out, it was Joe Foss, I believe, when he found out about it, he was going to find Buster. And Buster said to me, Eddie, Eddie, you got to tell him I didn't hit him. I said, Buster, 17,000 people saw you hit him. <laughs> You want me to lie? <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> but that was Buster. He was followed by Lou Saban. Yep, Lou Saban to me was one of the best, probably the best coach. He got more out of the team 
would bless the finances weren't good in them days and stuff like that. Like we lost a, a Mod Rashad for ten thousand dollars because the uh, he, he signed. We didn't come up fast enough with the money and stuff like that. But anyway, he uh, really, really was a, a, a master psychologist. He uh, he knew how to handle the guys. Whenever he had a, a pep talk, he always got up on the trunk and had 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 the guys look up to him. And I said, "Why do you do that?" He says, "I learned that in the army." He said, "When when when, you, when, when they have to look up to you, you, you command power." So when I I want them to listen when I tell them something. But he was a, a master at psychology. He uh, one time we were playing and the, we would won two or three games and. The guys were coming out late, especially Braxton and O.J. Simpson. So he came in to me and he said, Eddie, he said, come out to practice about five minutes late today when we start practice. He said, come out late. He said, I'm going to say something, but it's not about you. He said, I want to get something across to the guys. I said, okay. So sure enough, I come out late. We're, they're already practicing. He blows the whistle. Everybody up. Comes in there. He said, ah, we won four games in now. Now everybody's getting... Complacent. No one's coming out here late. The trainer comes out five minutes late. What if someone got hurt? Blah, blah, blah. And all this time, he's looking directly at O.J. Simpson and Jim Braxton. <laughs> and he, and he, so they got the message. He's not looking at me. He's looking straight at them. So and that's when, when he came in, all the guys, oh, Eddie, the coach was on your rear end, blah, 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 blah. I said, I, I got big shoulders. I can take a Luke Come in said, you did a good job, Eddie. <laughs> so that was, that was Lou. He was fantastic with with uh, the, 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 the psychology. And, and I can remember he cut Brubaker. We were in Houston. Brubaker got wide open, dropped the pass. And I was standing next to him, and Brubaker's number was 88. He says, 88, out the gate. He <laughs> cut him right at halftime. He said, go on and take your clothes off. He said, I, he said, I can get 10 guys off the street to do that. <laughs> that was Lou. You mentioned Simpson, and I know you've told the story in the past about you driving from your home to the stadium and O.J. Simpson driving by you. Yes, okay. O.J. had a, he, from United Import on Main Street, they would, because of his stature, would let him have all the import cars and stuff. So he had a Lamborghini there. I'll never forget it. It was 12 cylinders, had a stainless steel roof, and could really go fast. Well. He, 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 he must have stopped somewhere. With, they always rode with him and Reggie were, Mackenzie were, were buddies and, and roommates. And so they, they must have stopped somewhere because I had just finished work and I was going on the 219. And just as I got on the 219 at the mile strip exit, OJ comes by me going, I see him up there just before the, 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 where the 219 hits the 90. They got him stopped. He's in there. I drive by. He gets his ticket. I go by and we're getting up to where you get on the, the 290. Here he comes by me again. We get on the 290, he stopped again. <laughs> I said, OJ, you are the only guy I've ever known who got two tickets in 15 minutes. <laughs> and the beauty part of it is, Reggie says to me, Eddie, from now on, when we go home, I'm wearing my football helmet. <laughs> he said, he drives like a madman. But uh, that, that, that was a. True story about O.J. And he used to borrow a quarter from me every day for a candy bar. He probably owes me $75. <laughs> he never paid me back. Probably not likely. No. <laughs> I think there's some judgment creditors. Right. There. You get legal credit for that. <laughs> uh, you were at that early days when there was Kemp, LaMonica, La Monica, Kemp, what was your sense of that whole rivalry? Uh, uh, it, 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 it was a rivalry. Kemp, Kemp had the experience, in, what's it, and La Monica was, was learning. La Monica was a, was a unique duck. He, he had a, a different... Pre Jack would, would worry about things, because he was really, really a, 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 a cerebral guy. And it was always, when he, had, when he missed a pass or he did something, he would worry about it. And that was another re quarterback like that was Joe Ferguson. They always brooded on what they remember. If they could have a bad pass, they remembered it the whole game. Kemp was like that too. La Monica was the other way around. I can remember we were playing. I'll give you two instances. We were playing a game against uh, uh, 
Boston and, and Kemp got hurt for something, got the air, wind knocked out of him, and Saban put in LaMonica. LaMonica called the play. It was third down and one, and he called the play, and he had the formation wrong. When he turned to hand the ball off, there was no back there. He was on that side. So he made the first down, and that's when they, they called timeout. He came to the bench, and Saban says, Man, you crazy, I try you, and you don't know right from left, near from far. How long have you been on this team? Blah, blah, blah. And he said, Coach, we only have 20 more seconds. I made the first down. Will you call the play, please? <laughs> <laughs> so another time we're in preseason, and LaMonica starts the game, and he's 0 for 11. And he comes back in third down, and he comes off the field, and Saban says, my God, LaMonica, you stink. You couldn't hit the ocean with a football, blah, blah, blah. He says, Coach, I'm going to complete the next 11 passes in a row. Saban says, how do you know that? He says, I'm a 50% passer. <laughs> Did you ever suspect when you were hanging around with Jack Kemp that he might have one day be a, a congressman, let alone a candidate for vice president? Yeah, yeah, I did because... He was uh, always he was always reading books and doing things like that, and he used to always. I grew up in a a, a democratic neighborhood, uh, and he was in a fluent neighborhood. We we used to have a lot of discussions. He'd always run by me like I can remember him telling me about whether well, do we need social security or not. I said, Jack, the poor guy needs social security. He said, What do you mean? He said, I said, my dad raised five kids. I said, I was the executor for his state when he died. The most he made was $2,700 in 1941, I mean, 51. I said, he, he would need Social Security if he did. I said, what does your dad do? He said, oh, he runs a trucking company. I said, how much does he make? He said, 39000 I said, my dad made 39000 He wouldn't need Social Security either. So <laughs> that's the kind of things that we do. And then he would, he would tell me, I said, Jack, to get elected, we have the discussion, the bell-shaped curve, you got to be in the middle. You can't be on one extreme or one at the other extreme. And I don't know if he took that, but he used to always give me this trickle-down economy. He would, I was telling him, you're the best red guy. I don't know, because he's a phys ed major. <laughs> but anyway, I voted for him every time he, he ran for anything. I wouldn't vote for him. Because I always thought it would be neat to be able to get up the phone and say, hey, President, this is Eddie Abram Musk. I want to tell you you're doing something wrong. <laughs> So, but and, and every time he, he comes in, we, we have a good chat, and he always runs things by me. He, 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 that's one thing he's done. He always listens to, to the other side. So he, I, I would vote for him. If he would run again, I'd vote for him with, like that. During that golden era, at least for me, it was in the, the 60s. Uh, that's how I'm aging myself. But uh, you had a couple of tackles there were quite extraordinary, Sestak and Dunaway. Talk about those two guys. Well, I think Tom Tom Sestak should be in the Hall of Fame. He was probably the best player we, we, we ever had defensive player. Uh, he he made Billy Shaw because they used to stay out after practice every time and do one on one uh, practice moves and him blocking uh, with with Billy. And Tom played the last two years. He had five knee surgeries on his knee. He played the last two years, he never practiced at all. He just played in the game. Because when he would play in the game, his knee would swell up and we'd, we'd have to take the whole week to get the swelling down and get the muscle back up uh, to where, where he could play again. And he did that for two years and made all league what, what was awesome. And I think had we ever gotten, Kansas City hadn't beaten us in that playoff game, we'd have given Green Bay a much better game because nobody, I don't know if you know this or not, but. In, in their heyday, nobody scored a touchdown on the ground in 19 straight games. And uh, New England finally broke that record, and it was debatable whether Guerin got in or not. Harry Jacobs, today, to this day, told me he didn't get across the, the goal line, but the referees called it. But uh, Green Bay had a terrific running attack with uh, Jimmy Taylor and Hornham, and then we got, I think we would have we beaten them, but that's history. What about Dunaway? Oh, Dunaway was a unique guy. He, he, he could run a 4'6", 40, 290 pounds. Tell you a little cute story about Dunaway. Him and McDowell were always overweight. So I, 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 
was told by Sam, get these guys down, get them on a diet. So Dunaway comes to me and says, Eddie, you tell me what I'm supposed to eat, I promise you I'll eat that. I said, okay. He said, what do you want for me to have for breakfast? I said, cereal, little milk, banana, glass of orange juice. Okay, and I gave him the other two things anyway. So now, the morning we come in after three weeks, because Dunaway's gained two pounds. I said, Dunaway, what are you doing? He said, Eddie, I'm following your diet exactly. I said, well, tell me what you had for breakfast this morning. He gave that litany that I told him to, 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 to have. And then McDowell sat behind him. Yeah, Eddie, he had the whole bowl of cereal. He had six bananas and a, and, and a half a gallon of milk. <laughs> And the, the, the other story, they, him and McDowell went to Russia's in Dunkirk. They had lobster dainties. They ate 85 <laughs> lobster dainties. And they, they run the guy out. And the manager came out and was mad at him. And she said, are you guys had enough? And he says, I suppose you want dessert. And Dunaway says, what do you have? He says, <laughs> he says strawberry shortcake. He says, I'll take two. <laughs> One of your uh, most prized moments, uh, and you mentioned the name, <coughs> Billy Shaw. Billy Shaw went into the Hall of Fame, and one day you were read in the paper that Billy Shaw was uh, nominated to go to the Hall of Fame to be inducted, and then you get a phone call. I get a phone call, and he asked me to, to be a presenter for him. And I, I was very hesitant about not doing it. My wife was standing next to me, and she said, he wants you to become president. I said, I'm shaking my head, yeah. She said, you tell him, yeah. <laughs> so, so I said, well, when the boss says you have to do it, Billy, you have to do it. So I, I'm glad I did. I, I, I was the first athletic trainer that ever was a presenter at, 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 at the, the Hall of Fame. And I wrote my own speech. It's in the book in the back. I wrote my own speech. The PR department in, in Buffalo wanted to, Scott Burke wanted to write it for me. But I wanted to do it myself because I was so nervous about going up there and speaking with uh, uh, all the bigwigs were there, Wellington, Maryland, all the, the, the guys from the, the old guys from the Chicago Bears and stuff, and uh, Sid Gilman, and so I was really nervous, but I got through it by just staring at my wife, and I, I didn't see anybody else, I just saw her, and I gave that speech, and uh, it, it, it was a real thrill for me. I, I really uh, appreciated that he asked me. Well, let me just say that uh, since Time Warner is here, and Time Warner is there filming this, that if you watch Channel 3 tonight, Channel 3 tonight, Channel 19 tonight, uh, you'll get a chance to see Eddie's speech the first time ever. In fact, probably the only time ever that there's been a, a trainer actually presented yes. to the Hall of Fame. Uh, Hall of Fame. So, I mean, it's a real tremendous compliment. What a success. And I'm just going to give you a little applause for that. Eddie. <laughs> I was real fortunate that they were able to do that, but I really didn't have a job because I really liked what I did. And uh, I bought cars for the guys. I, 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 I had it, helped them buy houses. I used to always kid myself I should put on my little white coat when, when they come into the offices. But uh, it was a real experience, and, 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 and the guys were all so good to me. Uh, and it was, like I say, I, I really enjoyed doing it. It wasn't a job. And uh, Mr. Wilson was always super to me. Whenever the coaches came, I was always nervous about losing my job. But he always told them, there are two guys, and it, you can fire anybody you want in the organization, but there's two guys you can't fire. The equipment man, Tony Marchetti, and Eddie Abramowski, the trainer, they're mine. <laughs> and so I was lucky for that. And I, I, I got to stay in one place 37 years. and. Got, got my family. I grew up in Erie, so I was really home. It takes me an hour and a half, hour and 40 minutes to get home. So I go home quite a bit. So I, I, I really have been blessed with everything. It sounded like this was a concluding statement, but I'm not done yet. Okay. <laughs> you can go as long as you want. Okay. Uh, 60, let's see, this would have been 63, 64 were the, the championship years? 64, and, yeah. 64 and 65. Okay, 64 and 65. And part and parcel of that was a, a, a team, you're playing the Chargers, and, and you played them in the championship game, and 
Talk about the hit. The hit against Keith Lincoln. Uh, the hit heard around the world. Okay. Uh, that was uh, Mike Stratton coming by, and when, what they were, they were, they were, they, they ran a little swing pass, and I think, I'm, if I'm not John Huffle, it's Hagel or Tobin Rote was the quarterback, and they hung them up to dry, and you know how when a guy goes in training camp and they ha have the guy hit, hit the sled and drive your sword and pick the guy up? That's exactly the way Mike hit him, and you could hear that smack, and boom, and he went down and he cracked three ribs, because we got Keith Lincoln later. Keith said he couldn't breathe for, for, for like two weeks. Uh, that was a, a terrific hit. I mean, it was unbelievable. That set the tone and we, we, were, we were on, on our way. <coughs> but that was a terrific hit. Do you get a sense uh, that, that, in fact, the, you know, they talk about the momentum changing. Did that, in fact, do you get a sense that from the sidelines? Yeah, you, you, you do. Uh, uh, a, a lot of things, like I, I can remember sometimes you, you have uh, a, 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 a uncanny thing is you're, you're not going to lose. Like I remember we were losing to somebody in, uh, I think it was uh, a Houston or something. And, uh, it was like a minute and a half to go in there punting and Haygood Clark was running the punt back and he, and he said to the guys, don't worry, I'll run it back for a touchdown. We're, we'll win this game. And sure as hell, he ran 65 yards. <laughs> but that's the way that they, the, 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 the guys always thought. And Kelly, we never lost. He always ran out of time, he told me. <laughs> he was a fantastic guy. And he doesn't get enough credit. He called all those plays all the time. No one, that, when they run that fast offense, no one, uh, no one called the plays. He called them for himself. And uh, we were fortunate, those guys in the 90s had well, they were all terrific guys. Will Wolford is a, uh, an attorney. He owns the Louisville uh, uh, Arena football team. His wife is an attorney. Uh, Jim Richard flies for Delta. Uh, Justin Cross flies for Northwestern. Uh, Kent Hall works for the Department of Agriculture in the state of Mississippi. Uh, Pete Metzler is a coach. They were all very, very bright guys. Uh, John Finas is going to become an orthopedic surgeon. His mom's a biochemist. His dad's an orthopedic surgeon. They were all very, very, very bright guys, and, 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 and they run everything by themselves. They, they were like every Friday, they would have a meeting and they would go over all the things they were going to do. And, and Kent Hull called all the blocking schemes all the time. He was an outright genius with that. And I mean, we had little Jimmy Richard when he had a big nose guy on him. He, Kent would help them and stuff like that. And they would say, hey, we can't run this play or we can't run that play. And when he would come to the sidelines, the coach, would, coach Lieber, Coach Marshall Brewer would say, what do you guys want to run? And so they, 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 they really, really uh, uh, were, 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 were awesome uh, uh, about that stuff. And we, we were fortunate. They used to call them the Phi Beta Kappa Bills. And they would worry about the fighting, but that's no more fighting than when you have a brother or sister and you're growing up and you're, you, you, you're, you're, when you're around them, familiarity breeds contempt and so you get mad at one another every now and then. But once the game starts, if you would ever say something to, about this guy or that guy, they'd all pounce on you. I mean, if someone would, would say, take a hit of someone out of bounds, man, if four guys run over there and grab that guy and pull him off. They, they, they really protected one another. and. Uh, Cute story about not always thinking you're going to win was the greatest game we ever won with Frank Wright. We were losing the game 28 to 7, okay? And we're, we, we're, we're, we're coming down the tunnel, and I'm going down with Dr. Weiss. I said, you know, doctor, we get the ball. If we score, it's 28 to 14. If we score quick, we got a lot of time. We can win this game. Well, first play, Frank gets intercepted 35 to 7. I said, man. We're done for. And I told Doc, I said, there's no way we can come out and think of it. He said, I agree, and he said, we're done for. And then Daryl Talley comes over and says, hey, to the defense, hey, guys, we got them right where we want them now. Let's go. <laughs> and what Walt Corey did at that time, Walt said to the defense, 
You know, they, they played that run and gun and run and shoot and whatever they call that thing with all them little um, muffins, uh, five foot nine guys uh, uh, <laughs> running around. But anyway, they, 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 they had, we put an extra defensive back in and we're doing all this stuff. So at that point in the game, he says, damn it, that's it. We're going to base defense. Telly, Bennett, you got to cover those Smurfs. That's it. <laughs> we're going to do it. We're going to play. We're going to knock that quarterback on his can. We're going to blitz him. If they get it, okay, they get it. But that's enough of that. And you saw what happened. When we played base defense, the, the, like you have an exhibition game, vanilla. And, they, 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 and them guys did it. But that's how, how good uh, they could cover. That's how good they were. And Darrell Talley was probably the, 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 the really the nuts and bolts of the, the, the defense. He, he was uh, really the, the leader. Another story about Talley. We're playing uh, Cincinnati. And Bruce Smith is going in and, 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 and he, he's going to make a tackle and, and, and a little running back for what's his name, hits him, hits him in the thigh and with his elbow. And he's laying on the ground. I go out on the field to, to get him. He said, oh, my thigh. Oh, it's killing me. Everything else. Darrell Telly come over to me and he said, Eddie, what's wrong with them? I said, he said that guy elbowed them with, uh, uh, in the thigh. He said, Bruce Smith, that guy weighs 178 pounds. You're 278 pounds. Get up! <laughs> he got right up, went to the, the sideline, played the next play. Honest, true story. Uh, let's go back to the right game. I just want to know what what decibel level did you hit when Steve Christie finally put that screw at the end of it? Oh, it was amazing. Uh, it, it, I'd say I had no no. You talk about being a, 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 a loser. I was a loser that day. I said, well, there's no way we can win. That. You, you can't come back from that. But the guys were ecstatic, and, and uh, the, 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 the people went bananas. I mean, it was really something. The, the, I, I spent five years in Detroit, and I always thought Detroit was a good sports town. But Buffalo really, really is a good sports town. And you can tell how the Sabres or the Bills do. If you're driving to work and they lost, the guy will cut you off. He'll give you the finger. <laughs> Everything else. But if you won, he'll wave to you. Hey, go ahead and do. I mean, that's the, 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 the fans in Buffalo are really, really fantastic fans. I, I, I love them. And, and, and uh, it, it, it's a shame. And he, I told what's the name not to ask me anything controversial, but I know a lot of people are worried about going to Toronto. But the reason Mr. Wilson is going to Toronto is we're trying to get the corporate headquarters to buy boxes here and bring their things. If they're going to pay $250 for a ticket and they can get a ticket here for $50 and they can drive the people there, they want to get it. Mr. Wilson, there have been 28 votes for moving the franchises since since 1960. He's voted against any move by any team 28 times, every time. Do you honestly think he's going to move the team while he's alive? Now, if he dies, that's the that thing, because he's going to give the, the executors going to run the thing, and they'll probably sell it to the highest bidder. But he won't leave Buffalo. Like, I can remember when they, a couple years ago they were saying, hey, because that stadium is getting a little run down now. And they said they wanted to build them a new stadium. He said, Eddie, what good would a new stadium do me? All it would do is cost the people a lot of money, and we can't charge any more for a ticket. And when we raised the tickets, they were, like four years ago, they wanted to raise the tickets $10. He told them, this is the gospel, he told them $3 a time for three years. Each time go up three. Don't stick the people with $10 all at once. And that's, that's the gospel. And he gets maligned for a lot of that stuff, and he, he is really, really a good guy. Talk about wide right. <laughs> wide right? We, we, we lost that game long before wide right. You know, we lost that game in the first half when, when they had a two-man rush and, and nine guys back, and we, we tried to pass all the time. And 
Thurman got 138 yards in the second half. Had we won that, it wouldn't have come to that. And I just visited Scott. Uh, I uh, did a book signing in Herndon. Uh, there's a place in Herndon, Virginia called Jimmy's. That uh, It's a Buffalo Bills. All the people in the Washington area go there for the game. And, and, and Scott was there. Uh, he's uh, selling insurance in there. He is a super, super guy. He's married to a Buffalo girl. It should have never come down to that. I, I, I really felt sorry for him because he, he won a lot of games. He won the Oakland game by with a kick, and he's won a lot of games. But you always remember, but it shouldn't have come down to that kick. There was a lot of game before that. We had beaten him 35 to 7 or 35 to 14 three weeks before that. So that's my take on that. The funniest thing that ever happened to Eddie Abramowski as a trainer was... Oh, I, I, one of the funny things. Is he things censoring that, himself right now, Pat? I just want to know. No, he's thinking. He's thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell one of them. Okay. <laughs> About my pants? Yeah. <laughs> I knew you'd say that. That's why I didn't want to say it. <laughs> All right, let's hear it. All right. I was, I always was on a diet. I was always losing weight and everything else, right? So, I, 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 this is one of my times. The ball players used to always say to me, hey, Eddie, you lose 25 pounds, I'll give you 50 bucks, or you do this. I, anyway, we have always contests. So anyway, I was in the process. Uh, Oscar, uh, not Oscar Robert, what's Robertson? Isaiah, Isaiah Robertson was offering me $200 if I could lose 25 pounds. So I was in the process of, anyway, my pants were, were, were very loose. And, uh, and someone went down on the field. I don't remember who it was because I was so embarrassed. But I went on the field, and when I bent over, I showed the cheeks of my rear end, and I had cleavage. <laughs> and so that, my, my, when I came home, all my kids would say, Daddy, Daddy, oh my God. <laughs> That's, that, that's my most embarrassing moment. The other thing I had happen to me is I was running on the field for OJ one time and I pulled my calf muscle. And so OJ had hurt his knee. And so when I got back, I was walking off the field. And, 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 and what's his name? Saban said to me, Oh, you're showing OJ how to walk? <laughs> I said, No, Lou. <laughs> my calf muscle. But anyway. Along those same lines, the funniest thing you saw as a Buffalo Bills fan. The funniest thing I, I, I always thought was was was, was Lou cutting uh, Brubaker. That I I never heard of a coach cutting a player in the in the on, on the field. He dropped the pass. He told him, keep on running right to the locker room. <laughs> that was I mean it. All the guys were just burst out laughing. Uh, uh, another huge story about uh, the, the football team is uh, not to laugh, but it, uh, I always think this is a thing. Uh, Joe Devlin is like a recluse. Uh, he, he lives in Eden. He doesn't do anything with the Bills. He, he, played, and he was always very, very, very down, quiet and everything else. And they made him <laughs> captain, and when he was captain, he was really demonstrative and, and, and vocal. And, and think, But anyway, when he got done... Uh, he was, we were playing against Houston, and it was on a drive, and Coach Bresnahan was the, 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 the offensive line coach, and the guy jumped the count on them and, and got in and, 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 and nailed Kelly. So when they came back, it was third down, they came back and he sat down, and Kentel sat next to him, and I was sitting next to Joe because he, 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 had, he had a sore ankle, and I was talking to see how he was doing, and Bresnahan comes up and says, Joe, you can't do that. You can't do that. You, can't, you gotta do it. He said, Coach, he jumped the count on me. He anticipated, I won't let it happen again. So President Hen walks away. Two minutes later, he comes back again. He says, God dang it, Joe. He says, I'm telling you. He says, you can't do that. And Kent's drinking a Gatorade like this. The third time he comes back to him again, it's gonna stay the same. He starts to say something. And Joe says, if you open your mouth, I'll grab you by the neck and shake you. <laughs> and Ken Hall is sitting there and he says, he means it, Tom. <laughs> Before I open up for questions.
questions from the audience. Pat, what's the what should I have asked Patty here that I'm sort of missing? That story you said, gee, I wish because you'll be driving back and you'll say, boy, Greg would have asked this question. What's the one I'm missing? I, I think you've done a really good job. I never heard that last one. <laughs> I really like that one. I, I need to add, though, with the incident with the pan, when they first started sliding down, we have five daughters, no sons, no boys around, and the camera, they see it going, and, the, and they're like, oh, God, the camera's going to move away. It goes right, <laughs> right on to the crack. <laughs> and the kids are like, oh, God, I can't go to school tomorrow. <laughs> and I'm like, no one saw it. It's OK. The, as soon as the play changed, the phone started. <laughs> oh, my God, your old man's crack looks great. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> You brought her along, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Jim? This has been absolutely wonderful. I, I've got a story I need to get an answer about. There was a Monday night game when OJ had been holding out, and he came back for the first time in that Monday night game. And we're sitting up there in our seats, which my two sons still have to this day. This was years ago. And we noticed that nobody on the team spoke to him. And the, it, it, is that right? Is yeah, right? The, 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 there, there wasn't a lot, of, a lot of animosity because they had, that was one of the reasons Saban left the second time, too. I, I don't know if you know the story. I'll get into the, the end of that about what happened. But I'll tell you the story of what happened and why he came in late. His first wife, Marguerite, didn't like the cold weather in Buffalo and they didn't want to come. And so O.J. decided he wasn't, didn't want to play in Buffalo anymore. And so he, he told what's his name, Ralph, I don't want to play. So Mr. Wilson said to him, if you, I want you to tell me in person that you don't want to play. So he said, I'll fly out to the uh, L.A. airport. We'll meet and we'll have breakfast. And you tell me <coughs> head, head to head, you don't want to play. So. You know, before Mr. Wilson is coming out there, he's talking to Marguerite, and he said, he's going to ask me, I know he's going to want to pressure me to play, but he, he says, I, I, I'm doing a new contract. So he said, you know, Joe Namath is making $370,000 a year. That's the highest paid player in the league. He says, I'm going to ask Ralph for $750,000. <laughs> He'll never give me that. And so he went there, and he said he was thinking, and O.J., I mean, Mr. Wilson said, O.J., what's it going to take for you to play for the Bills? He said, Mr. Wilson, I don't know how to tell you this, but I need 750000 He said he just, he had his age holidays, took another bite, and says, you got it. And that's how he came. And he came, and all the players, we had nobody making more than $140,000 on the team at that time. And so, they, and they were going to feature Jimmy Braxton, the, all the plays for Jimmy Braxton. And when O.J. came in, he, uh, Lou was told, make sure you play him, because we're paying all this money and everything else. And so the guys were really, really upset. And Bubba hurt his knee that first game, and, and never was the, was, was the same. And that was one of the reasons why, 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 why Lou left, because he didn't want the, 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 all the notoriety with O.J. after that. And that, that, that was, there was a lot of animosity. Uh, Chandler and Tony Green and all those guys, they were all making like 80, 90, 100,000. And he was, you know, double what anybody in the whole league, even better than Namath. <coughs> yeah, Fred first. Uh, the, uh, back in the early 60s, maybe mid-60s, a lot of the Bills players didn't make much more than a guy of Bethlehem Steel at that time. So you saw that era. Then uh, run of the mill players today, 500,000, 800,000, a million bucks. What change, if any, did you see in the locker room or the behavior of these uh, young athletes, these people in their 20s making tremendously different kind of money? They're, they're, they're not as close. They're, 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 they're all talking on their cell phone. They, they, they don't go out to dinner together. When we went to, to I remember going to Denver, 
We had 23 guys go when, when we landed to go, go out to dinner that night. And, 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 and I always think, now, even with, with all that money they make, they, they, they feed them breakfast, they feed them lunch, they feed them everything. I, I, myself, personally, I think they, the, 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 the guys, I used to always tell them, hey, get your education, guys. You're going to make a lot more being a, 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 whatever you're going to do because you only can play football until you're 35 or something. Get an education, I'd encourage that. At the end, I was telling them, hey, get a good agent, good accountant, and have them just give you a paycheck and put all the money away and him run it. And you can't, have, you can't give those guys that money, a lot of them, because they just waste it. So if you have to, I was always telling them, hey, get a good guy you can trust and have them give you a paycheck every week. And that's what happened. But really, there's no, there's no camaraderie, there's no... Uh, stick to it uh, uh, the, when, when, in, in the things, all those guys used to go after the game to Ilio De Palos in the back room. Uh, of the f of 50 guys, 40 of them to be there with their wives and family. So they knew everybody and everything. And it was, I say, and, uh, it, 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 it's not the same. And that was one of the reasons it, it was even hard for me because guys would want their own trainer and their own nutritionists and their own, what they, they have so much money. And I would tell the guy one thing and this guy would tell him the, another. And naturally I always thought I was right. <laughs> but, you know, you have to put up with that. So I think I got out at the right time. Thanks. Chuck? Uh, what could you tell us about a guy I watched grow up as a young kid, Shane Conlon down the street? Uh, Shane Conlon, Buckethead. Yeah. <laughs> he, had the biggest, he, he was a fantastic football player. We used to always kid him. His, 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 his calves were suing him for non-support because they were so skinny. <laughs> but he, he, there was a big controversy. I don't know if you know of it. There was a big controversy when we drafted Shane. They wanted a kid named Mike Junkin. The, the, the scouts and everybody was really high on Mike Mike Junkin, when he went to the combine, had the most bench presses, the best vertical jump, the what's everything you could have. He was number one of the linebackers. Well, the Michael Cleveland took him in front of us, which saved us a, 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 a big thing. But anyway, Conlon, all he did was win and make the best plays. And 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 so uh, there was a faction of guys saying, take Junkin. Or take what's it? Well, to make a long story short, you know how good Shane was for us. Junkin played two years for Cleveland. He was at Duke, and he didn't lead the team in tackling. Conlon led the team in tackling. He led the intercepting the Fiesta Bowl to, to win the game for him. He's what they call a winner, and he he always made the big plays when you needed it. And he was a tough kid. He was a better baseball player. He told me than he was a football player. He was a catcher. Yeah, that's what he told me. Yeah. The book you received here, Tale of the Tape, and the back cover, there's a quote that said, if you really want to know the stories behind the scenes of the Buffalo Bills, this book lets you sit at the feet of the greatest storytelling bill of them all. What memories Abe has brought back to all us guys to enjoy, and he has evidenced that big time today. And so on behalf of everybody here at Eddie Abramowski, I can't thank you enough. be around for a few minutes until yeah. Pat whisks them up. So if you have any private discussions you want to ask. Enjoy your